Okay, welcome everybody to the first pandemic meeting of the Montreal Inter-University Workshop on History and Philosophy of Mathematics. Uh, for those of you not on the mailing list, uh, you can send me a note and then I will um, add you to the mailing list and then you'll be informed about uh, events uh, on history and philosophy of mathematics. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about from a doodle to a theorem, a uh, case study in mathematical discovery. Uh, next slide. Usually in philosophy, um, people make a distinction between the context of justification, which is the proof, and then the discovery of certain bodies of knowledge. And philosophers tend to uh, focus so much on the notion of proof right, and leave the discovery aside because that's often not considered to be a rational process. So philosophers have little to say about it. Though more recently, uh, philosophers of mathematical practice have started to care about the methodology of mathematics and how does mathematics progress. And there are some famous accounts of discoveries. For example, uh, there's an account of Poincaré on a vacation, going into a bus and then having a great idea about the theory of Fuchsian functions. Um, other people like Leonard Henking has written a paper on the discovery of my completeness proofs. And some philosophers have also tried to see what mathematicians do in the wild, so to speak, by following them um, on their daily work and then seeing what, what they're doing. So Mary Lang has uh, looked at people who worked on C-star algebras, uh, uh, Jessica Carter on people who worked on free probability theory. Um, next. Uh, one problem with these is that often they, these are professional mathematicians, so it's difficult to know exactly what part of the of the work they're doing contributes to the discovery because of course they have a big body of knowledge um, and they, they do a lot of things. So it's difficult to isolate uh, what actually is uh, contributing to the new developments. And with one's discovery, uh, we have kind of first-hand account of a mathematical discovery from the initial conception of the idea that starts with doodling and trial and what, what he calls trial and better and then certain refinements to the end product, to the publication. Um, and this is done by somebody who's not a professional mathematician, right? So here um, we have a, a picture of Maria Mirzakhani, who has been called a doodler, also somebody who tried to, uh, who did a lot of uh, doodles. But in this case, again, it's difficult to say what part of the activity actually contributes to what of her research, because that's, of course, uh, very complicated uh, mathematics. In fact, she won the Fields uh, Medal in 2014. This is also something that Ruben Hirsch has called the front and the back of mathematics. The front is how mathematics is presented when you look at mathematical journals and papers, and the back is how mathematics is done. Right? And often that is the part that we don't see. Right? We only see the, the front. And the work of one is also, I think, very insightful because it also gives us the distinction between a student perspective, somebody who comes to mathematics from having learned it in school, but not have been trained as a professional researcher, and then compare this with you know, the, the work of, of researchers. Okay, next slide. And so let me say one uh, more thing about the kind of the importance of the discovery. It's a relatively simple theorem, which is very nice. So everybody, I think, will be able to understand uh, at least the main idea of uh, the theorem. Um, it is namely to, allows us to multiply the length of a line segment by a rational number by constructing only midpoints and a straight edge. So it's a geometrical constructions, um, construction that is based on compass and straight edge. It is very simple uh, because it doesn't also appeal to the parallel postulate, right? So in that sense, it's conceptually simpler than existing constructions from ancient Greece, for example, a theorem uh, that is attributed to Thales or is sometimes called intercept theorem. And uh, something that one also likes to point out is there is this nice um, parallel between a construction that uh, Gauss, the famous mathematician Gauss did, um, about uh, regular heptagons that he discovered at the age, that Gauss discovered at age 18 and then published when he was 19 in 1796. Uh, and Juan, 220 years later, also at the same age, uh, discovered uh, his discovery. So it's your turn now. You're muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, would you like to? Oh, yeah. This okay. Time? So, what yeah. we're going to do uh -huh. is the introduction, which I've already done. 
Um, then there's a part about from a doodle, the, the, basically the discovery part um, that has to do with experimentation and also finding a way of turning an infinite construction into a finite one and verifying these results in terms of uh, computer programs. And then the shaping of these ideas into the mathematical publication that has to do a lot with sharing the ideas, um, the interactions with Gilbert Labelle and the whole publication process. And at the end, I'll sum up again, uh, all of this with a short conclusion. So now Juan. Thank you very much, Dirk. Now, I, I just wanna, okay. I can't see everybody, but uh, first I wanna thank everyone for coming. It's very special that I'm seeing like friends from childhood and all the way to university and also teachers from high school all the way to university um, and family as well. So th thank you for coming. And those that will see the recording, thank you as, as well. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start um, with like the background before this started. I have always enjoyed drawing, sometimes things that I see or sometimes just doodles um, that can be like just points and lines no? with, with no specific goal. Um, but also I've always really liked math. And so my doodles tended to, to be like geometrical doodles. And I also really enjoy talking with uh, well, with teachers and professors in general, but particularly math teachers in high school. And uh, when I was at Marie de France, I would stay almost every day, well, every after every class with Monsieur Brun, Christophe Brun. And we would draw on the chalkboard, like a geometrical shapes. And, and I would always try to uh, find new constructions or new ways to draw something and uh, represent it geometrically. And I, sometimes I thought it was new, but he would say, oh yeah, that's, that's great, but it already exists, no? So I thought that I was like discovering these things, but many of them, like they all already existed. And so the story I'm gonna tell you is about the first time that I discovered something that happened to be new. Um, so yeah, the initial conception of the idea, uh, I, I was drawing these doodles, like the one you see in the image, in a bunch of notebooks and um, this was on my high school agenda, uh, sorry, my stage of agenda. And then um, th that was at age 18. It's in, in Quebec, it's before university. And so I discovered that by drawing a series of midpoints, starting at a random point, um, it, it was possible to divide a line segment into three equal parts, as I will show in the next image. And, and I'm like, oh, that, that's very cool. So I, I continued to do it. And I drew it many times. The image I have here is just one of many and I chose it because there's a smiley. So I thought it was more fun. Um, and it was a, a visual truth that it seemed to work but it was not a proof theorem. Then, um, so I put the same image below and you see that this computer drawing is, is more clear. Um, and this is where the, the first midpoint paths appeared. So the midpoint path is a series of midpoints. Here you can see point zero. And then if you go towards U, you make the midpoint M1. And then if you go from M1 to V, you draw the midpoint and you get M2. And then again, M3, M4, M5, progressively, always going towards U and V. So the arrows are just uh, meant to represent, to make it um, more easy to understand visually. So it's called a path because you go from one point to the next, no? And, and then, yeah, I started discovering patterns. And, and I saw that if you did this to infinity, which I couldn't draw to infinity, but I just imagined that um, it would, when it would end up on line UV, these points would divide the line segment into three equal parts. Then I started doing different experiments. And, and I saw that if you went towards V, towards U, towards V, towards U, an infinite amount of times, you could divide it into three and it always worked. And then I said, well, why always V and U, no? So I started to try different things. Like what if I go to V, then V, then U, then U, then V, then V, U, U. And so I, by doing different combinations, I discovered that I could divide it into five equal parts, like the image in the middle, and then seven equal parts, only by doing these midpoint paths to infinity. And uh, the series of midpoints were different. 
but so I, I found this really cool because now it wasn't only one third. It was like you could divide it into different numbers. But the problem is that it was an infinite construction. And I, I really like compass and straight edge constructions. Um, but, but the problem is that if a construction is infinite, it doesn't really count. Like the geometers of ancient Greece would have not accepted my construction. So even though it, I was happy about it, I, I wasn't convinced that it was something very important because it, was a, it wasn't, wasn't complete, no? You couldn't finish it. But then I discovered this that changed everything. Actually, by, by drawing the, those same midpoint paths, some points uh, were aligned. So they all lied in, in, in families of parallel lines. So here like M0, M2, M4, M6, they were all aligned. And then M1, M3, and so on. And this wasn't only for one third, it was also for one fifth, for one seventh, and, and so on. So by discovering these parallel lines, um, it, it, this became possible in the next slide. So I didn't have to draw all the points. I could just draw the minimal ex expression of the midpoint path. I could reduce it to M0, M1, M2. And, and then because the other points were aligned, I didn't have to construct them. So the straight line passing by M0 and M2 would cut UV at point P, which was one third. And this meant that it, it was constructible with a finite number of steps and the ancient Greeks would have accepted it. So then I was uh, much happier. And the same for one fifth and uh, other ratios. It, you just had to do it once, like the minimal expression of the midpoint path, and you could construct the point, point P with the straight line. Then, uh, well, even though it, it seemed to work when I drew it, I still had to verify it with a computer, no? Or that's, that's what I thought was the, the best thing to do. So I went to GeoGebra, which is a program that we, we learned in high school. And, and there I was able to move M0 anywhere. And this, this demonstrated that no matter where M0 was located, it would always construct point P at one third and with other fractions. And also something nice is that unlike paper in the computer, you can zoom in as much as you want. So I would, I would zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. And it was like 0 0.33333. And I was just like getting more and more excited until I saw that, yes, it was one third. So that was fun too. Um, and then, yeah, so I, I had started with my agenda and other, other notebooks, but at some point I, I thought that this was like the, the process of discovery was very important and I didn't want it to get lost like in random pieces of paper. So I started to get these notebooks and it was great because I could fit in my pocket sometimes saying, yeah, I could, I could draw everywhere. And, and it was like, if, if I ever had a thought, I could continue to work on it. And sometimes it was things that didn't work. Sometimes they did work. And instead of ca calling it trial and error, uh, in the article, we say trial and better, because in a way it, you're always progressing. It's if you make a mistake, you know that that's not the way to go. And so sometimes some things were crossed out. Others were like, they worked. Um, and I would also write my questions in the notebooks. So I, I tracked how my thoughts were progressing and questions would lead to results, which would lead to more questions and then so on. Um, and sorry, once again, as I said, I, I would doodle everywhere and I really enjoyed uh, drawing in the bus and the metro because being in, a, in some sort of transport, it meant that I couldn't go anywhere. I had to be there. So it was the perfect moment to doodle. So these are some more, uh, more pages. And as, as you can see, there's a lot of text in some of them. Um, there's always some like graphic image, like uh, points and lines. Sometimes I would like, uh, I don't know, circle the important things, uh, some equations, whatever. And, and yeah, so I have progressively had more and more Then I had two. And, <laughs> and today I have like all of these. Uh -huh. And yeah, some are things that uh, weren't actually new, uh, some, some were, but yeah, I, I really like having these notebooks. 
Okay, and then um, th this was a very important moment of the discovery because even though I could get one third, one fifth and all those things, I, I had no idea why that worked. I didn't know why going to V and then to U made one third. Uh, it just did. But at one point, I discovered something that I call midpoint loops. So a midpoint loop, as opposed to a midpoint path, was, is, is this shown in red. It's, it's a midpoint path that starts and ends at the same point. So if you look at point P at one third and you go halfway towards V, you get to P1, which is at two thirds. And so from P2, P1, if you go halfway to, towards U, you get you go back to P. So in a way, um, saying go halfwards towards V and then halfwards towards U, you're, you're telling the point, like go somewhere and come back. And by by getting the point to go back to the initial position, um, that, that was a way of defining this point because no other point in space satisfy this condition. So it, it was the fixed point, the only fixed point. Um, if you look at this image on the right, you see the midpoint loop, which is P, P1, P, and then the, the midpoint path, M0, M1, M2. And so for any point M0, no matter where it is, it will always make a path. Um, so for any mid, given midpoint series, there is one midpoint loop in red and infinitely many midpoint paths, because as I said, they could start anywhere. And yeah, this uh, Eureka moment happened during Sebastian Bureau's psychology class, because e even though there were some times where I would only think about the discovery, some, I had thought about it so much that it like, stayed in the back of my head. And um, I, it was, I was always thinking about it somehow. And I remember that in that class, we were, uh, Monsieur Bureau was talking about the, the, function, the parts of the brain and their functions. And I don't know what he said, uh, but, but somehow that's when I, I found this. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, so that was a very important moment because this was applicable uh, for any rational number. And it allowed me to find this series of midpoints. So here, let's say if we write VU, it meant go half towards V, half towards U. And by, by drawing these midpoint loops, I could determine the series of midpoints for any, any fraction. And, and that is when it became possible to multiply the length of a line segment by a rational number between zero and one by constructing only midpoints and a straight line. So uh, as, as Dirk mentioned in the beginning, there was already a way of, of getting this result, but not with midpoints and it used parallel lines. And uh, to define parallel lines, you have to talk about infinity in a way. So that's why uh, Dirk, Dirk told me that conceptually, this, this construction is simpler than the one that existed in antiquity, which I, I found crazy. Mm. And then to a theorem. So this part is more like that, that's how the discovery happened or part of it. But then I said, uh, well, I, ha I have to share this somehow now. And so I felt like I had the responsibility and the honor to understand how it really worked and then to publish it. So uh, when I was in Sejep at, at Brebeuf, I, I shared it with many, um, many teachers, like Philippe Dampierre, who's here, uh, Marie-Claude Perigny, Anne-Marie Lorrain, Louis-Philippe Giroux, and Christophe Brun, who was in high school. And I, I really enjoyed talking with them, not only about this, but about math in general and their courses. And, and we would often also stay after class to talk. And, and so they got to see different parts of the discovery, like different moments as it progressed. Also of François Meunier uh, and Dave Anctil. So uh, I, I was like sharing it with, with many people and they would give me ideas or say like, oh, what about this? And so it was like a collective effort that motivated me and also led me to uh, find more things. And at one point when I was Anne-Marie Laurent's student, it, it was kind of advanced, the discovery. And she, she told me, oh, this is really cool. Uh, you should contact Gilbert Labelle. And, and Gilbert Labelle had been her professor. 
And at that point, he was a professor emeritus at UCAM, and he was uh, retired, but still worked in his research. And immediately he became like a legend to me because she told me that he used to write the questions for the, the Mathematical Association of Quebec's math competition that I had, I had done as a participant. So I'm like, oh, wow, he made these questions. That's, that's amazing, no? And so I, I sent him an email, uh, and which was actually super long. Um, and then uh, he replied, so I, I was very happy. And I, he said, uh, yes, you can come to my office. We could talk about it. And so I, I visited this building at UCAM, which I had seen many times from the outside and I, I always found cool. And, and we got to draw on his chalkboard. And that was a, it's one of the most memorable, memorable moments of my, well, I, my studies in stage up, but my studies overall, because talking with him, I felt like a real mathematician and also drawing in like a university chalkboard that I had never done. Um, and I, I was very happy when he said that he had never seen the construction before because it was possible that I showed it to him and he was like, oh, that's cool. But yeah, everybody knows it. No? So that gave me more hope. And he told me that um, to, to give him some time and he would stay with my draft and he would sh send me some comments. And then a couple of months after, I, I kept working on the discovery and uh, we also exchanged a couple emails. And one day, I remember it was before a, a theater class, I received this email and it's one of the greatest gifts I have ever received. And it was the, the draft, but uh, rewritten by Gilbert Labelle, um, oh, who by the way is, is in the presentation, um, and he's, he's attending. So this draft was a way of explaining the discovery, but in a more mathematical way. And it just made so much more sense and it was uh, more understandable, more complete. And uh, yeah, so I didn't stop doodling and discovering, but this draft became the foundation for everything that I did after that. Then, um, yeah, so the differences between the drafts is that in, in my draft, um, it, it was like more naive in a way. It, we could say that it was from a doodle to a theorem. So it, it's because it, it started with the doodles and the theorem was like at the end. It was similar to high school math textbooks because I didn't know what a math article looked like. Um, also, the examples would get increasingly complicated. And I would say, uh, like, you start with this, like one third, uh, one fifth, whatever. And so it would be like progressive. Um, and also the, the, the order would be like from definitions to uh, numerous examples. And then the theorems came and then some incomplete proofs. But, but that wasn't the way mathematicians presented their work. In Gilbert Labelle's draft, we could say that it's from a theorem to a doodle. Um, it was a professional mathematical article. And instead of having all the figures that I had, it was just a few figures at the end. The, yeah, it went from definitions to theorems to rigorous proofs. And then there was one example at the end. So the, the order of, of the presentation changed, which was unexpected. Um, and worse, I only used use geometry um, I, for the proofs and then for, um, yeah, also to define existing terms that I didn't know exist, existed. Uh, Gilbert Labelle used uh, things, elements from other areas of mathematics, like linear algebra, binary representation, modular arith arithmetic, arithmetic. And also, whereas mine was very redundant, it was like over 50 pages with lots of repetition. His was concise. It was uh, like 13 pages and it showed the essence of the discovery. And so I just saw that I, with all these stories, I'm, I'm going over the time, but okay, it, we're almost done. And, and one of the greatest things that he discovered that when I saw it, I thought it was like magic, is that the, the construction of the midpoint paths was super closely related to the binary representation of a fraction. So if you had one seventh, if you could write that in binary as 0 0.001001 uh, periodically. And so you get the binary period 001 shown here. 
then if you would invert it, you would get one zero zero. And finally, because point zero was u and point uh, v was one, you, you would translate this to vuu. So by replacing this, you would get the series of midpoints. So here, the midpoint series vuu defined the fixed point p17 on the line segment. And so that meant that if you went half towards v, then half towards u and half towards u, starting at any point, and then draw this straight line between the, the first and the last points of the midpoint path, uh, you would be able to construct the point. And yeah, so that was just like, I was, my, my mind was blown away. Mm. And, and then from that also, uh, this was before Gilbert Labelle's draft, but also it, it advanced with his help, that midpoint paths were generalized to homothetic paths, which were um, a higher class of midpoint paths, we could say, because they, were, they could be used not only in 2D on a paper, but also for 3D, um, like, like this structure that I made with stick models. Uh, but even like four dimensions and more like that, that aren't easy to understand spatially, but that, like they exist. And also um, it's called homothetic paths because the homotity, which, homotity, which is a transformation about scaling, um, that was the building block of the paths. So I, I decided to use that term to, to name them. And finally, to submit the paper, um, I kept working on, on the paper for like two or three months. And I sent it to the Bulletin AMQ of the Association Mathematique du Québec, which is the one Gilbert Labelle recommended. And it was an incredible experience. Um, and yeah, so it was Chemin Homothétique. And I also got some comments from the, from the anonymous referees, uh, which, which also taught me many things. One of them was that each definition and theorem must contain a single punch. Because I would say like uh, this, we have this, and then this happens, this happens, like many, many results in the same theorem. But they said, no, it should only have one single punch. Um, also that figures should read as a story, not as separate examples. What I used to do is I, I wanted to show how, how varied the results could be. So I had very different uh, forms and drawings, well, uh, computer drawings, but they said that it was better to build, build up on the images that the readers had already seen. Uh, and so it, it would read more as a story, which was easier to understand. And there were other suggestions and corrections. And then I, I, I worked on those. And finally, it was published in May 2016. And if, to my surprise, it was one day before my last final exam in SAGEP. So it was like, yeah, if it had been two days after, I would have not published it in SAGEP. But that was a great coincidence. And so uh, to wrap up, there were two theorems that I won't get into detail in, but the midpoint path theorem gave you the series of midpoints. So it would say, if you want one seventh, you, you get to the series is VUU. And then the homothetic path theorem established a relationship between the midpoint, uh, midpoint loops and the midpoint paths or the homothetic paths and the homothetic loops. So this one made the construction possible whereas the first one told you how to make the construction. And then there were uh, two theorems about like infinite, infinite constructions and the center of gravity, but we won't talk about those. And yes, so th th that's, that's it for my part. Thank you so much for listening and uh, Dirk. Um, okay, Thank, yeah. thanks Thank for this uh, very nice presentation. I just want to uh, conclude uh, with a few remarks kind of from somebody who wants to understand mathematics from the outside, so to speak. Um, and one uh, or some interesting no, uh, things to note is that some things change from the way to the publication. And one is that the order of presentations of the ideas, right? With the appeal to examples or the, the doodles and the diagrams, they moved kind of from the beginning uh, at the, in the discovery phase to almost the appendices or the end of the sections in the paper, right? Um, also, one thing that changed is a lot is the use of concepts and results from other area of mathematics, like linear algebra, or binary representations, and modular arithmetic. They were all uh, uh, made contact with and are part of the, the final theorem. Right? And in fact, also the terminology and the 
new concepts. And in fact, I think uh, Brian told me also the title changed uh, subsequently. Kind of looking at it from a philosophical outlook more, there is, there's this tension between this power and freedom of thought, it's sometimes associated with a view that is called fictionalism or instrumentalism, and then the view or that sees mathematics as existing really. Right? Um, and one also talks often about the existence of, of points and, and, and lines and so on. So this is a realist or platonic view, and they seem both to play a role in this uh, development here. And of course, it also highlights the human aspect of mathematics, right? So mathematics is not just the deduction of, of theorems as one might think, but is actually a very dynamic enterprise that, that has to be nurtured and has to be encouraged. And it lives very much also from, from expert advice. So thank you very much. Uh, that's the, uh, that was what we wanted to say. And if you have any questions, the floor is open now for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and maybe you can stop the screen sharing. Uh, yeah.